afternoon and welcome to The Full Scottish on Sunday the 30th of January. My name is Maggie Lennon and we'll start the programme as usual with the up-to-date coronavirus statistics. As of two o'clock yesterday, there were 6,679 new cases confirmed by either a lateral flow device or a PCR test. 18 new reported deaths of people who've tested positive. 4,410,290 people have received their first dose of the COVID-19 vaccination, <clears throat> excuse me, and 4,122,152 have received their second. 3,286,355 have received a third dose or a booster jab. There were 1,291 people in hospital with recently confirmed COVID-19, of whom uh, 35 were in intensive care. Since the start of the pandemic in Scotland, a total of 10,309 patients who've tested positive have sadly died. I'm joined this afternoon by Jim Fairley, MSP for Perth for South and Kinrosshire. Hi, Jim, how are you? I'm very well, Maggie. Nice to be here. Nice to see you. Right, we're going to start with Ukraine. Um, obviously, uh, we've been reporting for some time that there's a real possibility in late January, early February, that Russia might decide to invade the Ukraine. There's been a massive build-up of troops. It's ramping up at the moment because uh, both the United Kingdom and the United States have said that they're willing to put boots on the ground. Britain's gone a wee bit further and said not just boots on the ground, planes in the sky and ships in the sea. Um, there's rocket systems um, in place in Estonia. There are fast jets based in Cyprus, keeping an eye on Romanian and Bulgarian airspace. And it's being done to support NATO allies in the Baltic states and on the borders with um, Russia. So it's a real escalation. Um, do you think that the sanctions that are being talked about as the first step in a diplomatic response would work? And more importantly, do you think any of these sanctions might be applied? Well, we have to hope that the sanctions will work uh, because the alternative is uh, catastrophic. The last thing we want to see is uh, any conflict happening in Europe. Um, the I'm delighted to see that Germany have, have now decided that the, the Russian oil, uh, the Russian gas pipe is on the table as far as sanctions are concerned. Um, whether they're actually going to be imposed, you have to kind of ask yourself, why isn't London already doing more about it? Because the, the number of Russian oligarchs that they have in London uh, currently with massive amounts of wealth, you would have thought that the UK government would have been able to tackle that very quickly and very effectively. So I'd, I'd be keen to understand, I was actually listening to Liz Truss on, on the radio, this, on the television this morning, and she was saying that um, uh, they, they've already seized a million pounds or a billion pounds worth of assets. Um, but that's chicken feed in terms of the amount of money that we're talking about uh, from Russian oligarchs who are massively invested in London. And, and I'd like to have a, a, some kind of understanding of just how much pressure the UK government could bring to Russian uh, financiers. But equally, are they constrained by the fact that uh, Russia, Russian oligarchs actually pay into the, to the Conservative Party coffers? Mm. So um, <laughs> I, I hope it works because the alternative, as I say, is catastrophic. Um, but right now, I'm, I would say I'm hedging my bets. Um, you're not the only one to raise issues about the amount of what's dirty money, Joe Biden called it. He was quite um, clear on that this week, saying he's concerned about the amount of dirty money from Russia that's in London and suggesting, without stating as boldly as you have, that there's something going wrong in terms of sanctions. Um, and as you say, the amount that they have announced that they've um, kept a hold of is, is nothing compared to what is in the country. But you mentioned the um, potential of the gas pipelines being involved in the sanctions. So at the moment, not much of the UK's gas comes via Europe. It's the North Sea mostly, but the rest of Europe um, gets most of its gas through the pipeline that comes through the Ukraine. And the new one, the Nord 2 pipeline, which hasn't yet been approved by regulators, which comes under the Baltic Sea, is the one that Germany is now saying we might decide um, that we won't allow this to, to start operating. And yep. while that is a sanction in terms of lost income to the to Russia, it might create a real 
um, energy crisis in Europe. And that would have a knock-on effect in the UK because it would mean that gas prices would go up and they're already going up and people are feeling the pinch at the moment. So, you know, a real energy crisis as a result of this, I mean, could we be seeing us back to kind of three-day weeks and power cuts and it being like the 1970s all over again? <laughs> well, well, let's hope not. As you say, uh, we're not nearly as reliant on the, the, the Russian gas pipeline or the, the Russian gas. I think Russia supplies about a third of the EU's gas in total. Um, so it, it's a big move for Germany to, to say, you know what, that's going to stop if you continue your, your aggression in the Ukraine. Um, but what it also highlights is the, the need for us to really ramp up our ability to, to produce um, renewable green energy right across Europe. Uh, now, we are making great strides here in, in, in Scotland. We're, we're, we're working really hard to get that green energy on the go. Um, but yes, the, the, I can see that there will definitely be problems in Europe if they continue to rely on the, the Russian state for so much of their, for their, for their uh, gas energy. Um, however, I, I, I'm also hearing that uh, the Americans and some of the, the, the Saudi countries are talking about how they can get, uh, I think it's liquid, ni liquid nitrogen gas imported in. So all of these things I'm, I'm pretty sure will be working very hard behind the scenes. But I, yeah, there I, is also... I heard, I heard that too about the liquid nitrogen gas coming from the United States. And you think, hmm, that's nice and convenient, isn't it, to boost the balance yes, of payments yes. of those countries? You know, it's like whenever there's an energy crisis, it's not a crisis for somebody, somebody wins. But actually, the institution for whom this is a real crisis, I think, is NATO, because it is yes. NATO. It's the whole existence of NATO that is kind of not under threat, but under question. So Russia have given three um, demands, which there's not a hope in hell, frankly, that NATO are going to agree to them. The three demands are that the Ukraine are banned from joining, and we know that um, Ukraine are keen to join NATO, that NATO must end activity in Europe, even in the member states which are close to Russia, and that there must be no missiles near or bordering Russia. Now, this cuts right across um, NATO ideology, so there's no chance that NATO are going to agree to this. But... One of the reasons that the West is getting involved in Ukraine, and a few people have said, you know, almost harking back to Chamberlain's famous comments about the annexation of Czechoslovakia by uh, Nazi Germany. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a battle between two peoples far away of whom we know nothing. Quite a lot of people have said, why is this becoming an issue for the West? But um, most of European countries, including the United States and, ironically, Russia, signed an agreement in the mid-1990s to make sure that the integrity of Ukraine's borders were maintained and to protect yeah. it in the face of any act of aggression. But in 2014, when Putin annexed the Crimea Peninsula from Ukraine, we made a lot of mutterings about it. But the West did nothing. So actually, have they kind of given this problem to themselves? Is Putin sitting back going, well, you did nothing over Crimea. You're not actually going to do anything over the Ukraine. So are we kind of paying the price for letting him off the hook seven years ago? Oh, I, I, if you look at uh, Putin's history, um, he has categorically tried to break every rule in the book. And I think you're... You, what you're saying there has got a, a, an element of truth to it. He's pushing boundaries all the time. And it's just, how far can I go there? Yep, okay, I got away with that. Let's go a little bit further. So yes, th there is definitely an element of, um, uh, they've made the, the West have made a rod for their own back in acquiescing to some of the, the stuff that, that Putin has done. But I think there is a real uh, sense this time that, okay, you've gone far enough. Um, what slightly concerns me, though, is I was listening to um, Jens Stelzenberg this morning, the, the, the um, uh, Secretary General of, of NATO, and he was saying that um, they will be loading on the, the economic sanctions, and that should be enough to stop Russia. But if it isn't, there is no guarantee that NATO would say, right, we will, we will put a stop to this, we will put troops on the ground. Um, now, not, not that I'm advocating that we should, but 
what else are they going to do? You know, what else did NATO do? They're, it's clearly a sign that Putin is, is flexing his muscles. He's, he's doing a bit of saber rattling and he's pushing the, the boundaries as far as he can go. And um, NATO is going to have to respond very strongly. So, because uh, it, it, it affects any country that is being imposed upon by a big, strong neighbor needs to know that it's, that it's got some security from the rest of the world. So I think that Ukraine is very much, uh, it's it may be a country that's far away, but people it's, are people. It's not really. Right? It's, in the, it's in the European continent. Um, and yes, it's a democracy. Yeah, I, it's a democracy yes, that, as I, you say, is under threat from this regime. And I mean, people are really concerned that he might not stop at Ukraine. Does he start turning his attention to the Baltic states, Lithuania, Estonia, yeah. Latvia? Yeah. They're extremely worried. Now, obviously, they are members of NATO. They're members of the yes. European Union. That that would be something that they would have to act. But it's back to what I was saying. NATO seem a little bit hamstrung by this. There's not a huge mm -hmm. agreement. I have to say it's quite ironic to hear Johnson talk about it's important that we defend the principles on which a united Europe was founded after the Second World War, given his willingness to turn his back on Europe after Brexit. Um, and I, I'm wondering whether this isn't a bit of um, Johnson hoping to be able to show some kind of statesmanship or, you know, hoping that this will take away from his troubles at home. It's got almost a feeling of Margaret Thatcher's difficult period when the Falklands were invaded. And I'm sure you know, this suggesting that he's actually going to go to Moscow in the next week or two, that he's going to phone Vladimir over the weekend and have a chat with him. You know, there's a, there's a little bit of that. It's, it's, not, it's not clear cut at all. So it, it, do you think that's pushing, pushing it a bit to suggest that Johnson's almost wanting something to kick off? Mm, let's rewind a wee bit. In, in terms of Johnson's uh, hypocrisy, you're, you're talking about his, uh, you know, let's be one united Europe in terms of, of dealing with the Ukrainian issue. And then, you know, clearly Brexit has done what it's done. But there's also the, the um, you know, we've got to respect democracy. And yet in Scotland, we've had uh, mandate after mandate to hold an independence referendum. And Boris Johnson thinks that somehow he can stand in the way of that. Uh, so that there are definitely Scottish parallels as far as I'm concerned. If you're going to respect democracy, you respect democracy. So when Scotland says that we're having an independence referendum, as clearly voted for by the people of Scotland, then that's what will happen. But yes, in terms of going back to the, the main point that you were making, I absolutely think that the we will come on to talk about the Sugary Inquiry, but the longer uh, he can hold his position and give this impression of being a statesman, and yes, I'm going to be the, I'll be the peace broker, I'll be the guy that goes and speaks to Vladimir Putin. Um, there is definitely, I, I get the sense coming out of London that there is this sense of, um, hold on, hold on to him as long as we can, and the longer it goes on, uh, the more that we can create this belief that there are much bigger issues around what's happening in Ukraine or what's happening in, in, in other areas, that he's trying to create this, um, it's, it's a bit late, I have to say, but he's trying to create this this uh, different persona to the one that he has clearly worked upon to get himself to the position that he's in at the moment. So, mm. so yeah, no, I, I fully take on board what you're saying in terms of, of how it plays out for, for the UK government, or particularly for Boris Johnson. Well, obviously, we'll be continuing to keep a close eye on this story. Um, we mentioned the energy crisis, and just while I've got you on the show this morning, Jim, I wondered if you want to give us any update on what's ho happening about the overall energy situation, because obviously that's impacting on your constituency particularly, and how any talks or discussions have been going. Yes, uh, the, the, overall ener the overall crisis, I have to say, I myself, John Swinney and Pete Wishart all met with the chief executive of Ovo Energy last week or the week before, um, Adrian Letts, and what we were looking to do was try to get a sense, an understanding of why these, uh, why they were going to close the the, the headquarters in Perth. Um, SSC, when Stephen Fitzpatrick took over over Energy about two and a half years ago, he talked about what a great fit they were and the fantastic workforce that were that were already employed in um, SSC in Perth, uh, and how excited he was to be working with that fantastic workforce. Um, we've already had a, a, a load of redundancies since the company took over. They say that things have changed because of COVID. I don't believe it's got anything to do with COVID. 
uh, homeworking has actually made, should have made things easier. Uh, and there will no doubt be some people who will want to work from home, but there's lots of people who want to get back into the office. Um, so where we are at the moment, the, the, the discussions are still ongoing. Um, myself, John, Swinney and Pete will be meeting, Pete Wishart will be meeting with them again in mid to late February, uh, once they've had a, a round of voluntary redundancies. But what really concerned us was the fact that we couldn't get any guarantee that if the number of voluntary redundancies that they were looking for wasn't met, that there wouldn't then be compulsory redundancies. So that's the bit that we are trying to, to push for at the moment. They've also said that what they're going to do is they're going to open up a, a training hub in Glasgow. So I put the question directly to them, well, why do you not have that training hub here in Perth? Um, it's got great access links. Uh, mm -hmm. You've got a fantastic, well-trained staff um, in, the, in the, the place already. It's there, it exists, it's part of our community. And they've absolutely made up their mind that they're moving to Glasgow. So I then pressed them on how many jobs would actually be created in Glasgow by closing the Perth and Cumbernauld, the Edinburgh and Dunfermline offices. And um, they're not creating any new jobs. What they say is that there will be a thousand jobs will be supported by it, but it's, it's going to be nothing more than a training office. From what I can make out, it'll be nothing more than a training office where people who are working remotely will travel to Glasgow, get a day or two days training, and then go back to working from home. And there is, I see great things about their mechanization and, and making customer service even better. But it looks to me as what they're going to do is they're actually going to mechanize their entire customer services over a period of time. Um, so I, I, we're working very hard. I've, I've raised it twice or three times now in the, in the chamber with the First Minister and with um, Ivan McKee. I'm asking OVO to reverse the decision. It's the, that's the position we are taking at the moment, that there's no reason for this office to be closed when there is still a requirement for people to be employed by the company. Um, so that will be the, the question we'll be going back to them. And I'm very much hoping Stephen Fitzpatrick gives a, a, a great uh, persona when he's on the television. He comes across as a really lovely, genuine guy, uh, a market disruptor, want to do his, the right thing by customers, want to do the right thing by the communities. Well, it's not doing the right thing by the communities where he's mm. laying off hundreds and hundreds of jobs um, because these people are consumers. These people have families. These people have mortgages to pay. And they're in my constituency, they're in John's constituency. Um, so yeah, we will be fighting very hard and trying to get some, some answers to the questions that our constituents have and seeing if we can get this, um, this decision reversed. So fingers oh, crossed. Yeah, thanks for that update, but it doesn't make particularly good hearing, I'm afraid. But yeah, maybe, no, maybe there's still some opportunity. You mentioned that we'd be talking about the uh, Susan Gray report, and uh, so we are now talking about it. Um, obviously, uh, the questions are, when's it coming out? What's it going to have in it? The what's it going to have in it has changed because of the intervention by the Metropolitan Police. So that's been actually quite an interesting development in lots of ways, because there has been a huge backlash um, from MPs across the political spectrum to the Metropolitan Police's suggestion or insistence that the report did not mention anything specifically which might impact on their investigation. Um, some MPs have gone as far as to claim the Metropolitan Police is a broken organisation. Um, and uh, someone said this week that it was an abuse of power by the Metropolitan Police to do this, because this case isn't sub judice. If it was sub judice, it wouldn't be discussed in the House of Commons. It's not. Yeah. And it appears to me that they're, they're looking at potential criminality. The Gray report isn't. It's looking at the process, who was responsible, who knew what and when, and how did that fit against the rules. There may be criminality, there may be fines or whatever, but they're looking at different things. So would you agree that the Metropolitan Police is a broken organisation and it's an abuse of power? Let, let's go back to the start of this. I, I remember when the, the thing first broke um, and it was the, uh, the, there was the headlines coming out that Boris Johnson had been attending parties uh, during lockdown, that parties were taking place in Downing Street and he was supposed to have known nothing about it. Now, Pete Wishart at that time called for a, a criminal investigation by the Met Office and they said, it's, 
we're, we're not even going to bother. It was then put to them again, as more revelations came out, that they absolutely need to look at that. And then they came out and says, well, we don't look at retrospective uh, COVID violations. We'll only look at them as and when they're happening. The Sue Gray report comes along and then they say, well, you know, we'll wait to see what the Sue Gray report comes out with. And the first thing that comes to my head is, well, why are you waiting for some civil servant to do an investigation? If you think there is a, a reason to be investigating things that the, the has happened in Downing Street, you've got more security and police officers on the doors and in the grounds of the place than anybody else. Why would you need a civil servant's report? So they're still not getting involved. And then the Sue Gray report is getting to the stage where it's getting close to being um, uh, published. And all of a sudden they're all over it and telling uh, Sue Gray that it would be better not to publish areas that she might uh, or, or that they might want to investigate. And I think the important bit is we're talking about at most fines for people having broken the law. We're not talking about jurors having to be called and, and major trials. We're talking about fines. So why such a, a, a huge effort to, to, to keep it, you know, contained? So I am not for one second saying that it's a, a broken organization, but I think there's gonna to have to be some very serious questions asked at the other end of this as to why they took the decisions that they took at the timings of when they took them. Because going back to what we were talking about earlier on when we were talking about Ukraine, the longer this goes on, the better it is for Boris Johnson, the more distance he can put between him and what's happened. And the, the bigger the crises that happen in the country, the bigger the issues that they are. And Liz Truss said it again on, on television this morning. We've got bigger issues to deal with. There are much more important things. Well, there are very important things that have to be dealt with, that have to be dealt with. But the UK government seems to be paralyzed by its efforts to protect a prime minister who has clearly lied, clearly broken the rules, clearly takes everything as a joke, unless he has to try and look statesmanlike. Um, and, and I think it's an absolute scandal. Uh, yeah, you could argue there's, just... there's nothing more important than something that brings the integrity of a prime minister and a government into disrepute over things like lying. Because if he's lied about yeah. this, something yeah. not trivial at all, because we all know no. what was happening in the country while this was going on. Yes. People were losing, yeah. losing loved ones. People weren't able to be at the bedsides of people they loved who were dying. People couldn't go to funerals, all of that. But if you can lie yeah. about something like going to a party or not knowing if he was at a party, what else has he lied about? You yeah. say that there's distance and, it, it, you know, these claims are in the past, but no, they're still coming out. Late on Friday, um, and he, another claim came out that Carrie Johnson, Prime Minister's wife, um, allegedly sent messages to Number 10 staff encouraging them to meet for his birthday and saying that she'd bring the cake, the famous cake by which he was ambushed. Um, I believe a redacted version has been sent or is being sent to the Prime Minister this weekend, um, but we don't know what or what that doesn't contain. We don't know what the redactions will be. But across party politics now, people are calling for the report to be published in full and as quickly as possible. Um, Nicola Sturgeon's been very, very um, strong on that. And she's gone a bit further than you have done today, Jim, just basically calling it for what it is, suggesting it's all a bit of a stink. Um, but mm. no doubt, uh, perhaps with Monday morning, some clarity will emerge. I certainly um, can't wait to read it. I hope it's um, I hope it's as juicy as we think it might be. Um Moving on, today is the 50th anniversary of Bloody Sunday, also known as the Bogside Massacre, a day when one para opened fire on civil rights um, protesters protesting against internment without trial in the north of Ireland. 26 people were shot, 14 died, 13 on the day, and one a few weeks later as a result of his injuries. It was without doubt the most bloody day in the history of Northern Ireland, and the most um, uh, vicious attack by the British state in that part of the world. At the time, there was outrage, and there have been two investigations into Bloody Sunday. The first, uh, the Widgery uh, investigation, was a complete whitewash, 
But in 2010, 28 years after the events that Sunday, the Savile inquiry was quite clear that the attack was unjustified and unjustifiable. And shortly after that, David Cameron apologised. But Jim, that's really as far as it's gone. There was an attempt to bring one of the soldiers, Soldier F, as he was known, to justice, to trial, but it fell down because the other evidence that was going to be um, produced was deemed to be uh, inadmissible, not least because some of it came from another soldier who'd subsequently died. And so nothing has happened. No one has actually been held to account for this, certainly not the British Army. And the DUP went further and suggested that the army should be immune from any investigations into anything that they did in the north of Ireland. And we should say that one para were also involved in another mass shooting of civilians a few months later. Um, the Ulster Unionists didn't agree with the DUP on that particular position, but we are in a position now where the British Army are immune or are about to become immune from the Human Rights Act. So what should the people of Northern Ireland um, be pushing for and what, what's the very least that they should expect 50 years after this atrocity? Oh, God. You're talking about such a, a, a hellish thing to have happened. Um, Pushing for at this stage, absolute recognition of what happened was utterly shameful, should never have happened. Um, the soldier who was going to be uh, um, uh, charged, it's not going to happen. I would genuinely hope with, from my heart of hearts that what the people of Northern Ireland do is maintain their peace. That, that to me is, is the most important thing. Yes, we absolutely have to remember it. Yes, we should accept the fact that what the British Army did was utterly wrong, utterly reprehensible, um, but leave it there and make sure that peace is maintained in Ireland. Uh, that to me is, is the most crucial point. Now, it's no, any of my mem it's no member of my family that were killed. And I'm quite sure that the families who have lost loved ones will be absolutely furious at me saying, let's just leave it there. Um, so I, you know, from that point of view, I, I would, I will take that criticism. Um, but I think right now, the most important thing is maintaining peace in, in Northern Ireland. Um, it wasn't just that it was significant in the number of casualties, it was significant in two other ways. It shifted the perception from the Catholic community, because it was all Catholics who were murdered by the army. It shifted their perception away from the fact that the British forces were put into the north of Ireland to protect them, which, of course, was actually why they were originally sent in and they began to be seen as part of the problem. And it was significant in what it did in order to recruit vast numbers of people to join the provisional IRA and to ramp up the violence that ensued in the coming years. Um, so you can see why it, it, it's something that possibly people in the north of Ireland don't just want to um, say enough. But I take your point that the peace in Northern Ireland is absolutely essential. And obviously, you know, there's concerns about a lasting peace being affected because of Brexit and because of everything that's associated with that. Um, so those that are remembering Bloody Sunday, uh, uh, the nationalist community today, is that your hope that they are saying it was an awful thing to happen, but let's look to the future and make sure it never happens again? Yes, I am. Um, and again, you know, it's not any member of my family that I lost, but I keep coming back to the bit in my head because I've thought about this a lot. What, what, do, what do we gain? Um, I think that the Ireland suffered huge amounts. There was, well, we all know what happened. And any kind of return to that, to me, is something that we absolutely have to avoid. So yes, I would say to the families, yeah, it's brutal, it's heartbreaking, it's, it's hellish. But for the sake of peace in, in the island, then I would hope that they would be looking to move on, yeah. Do you think it's right, though, that the British Army should not be able to be held account wherever they've committed um, atrocities? So at the moment, there's a suggestion, and, and to be honest, I can't remember if it's actually 
entered law or whether it's in it's it's part of a new bill that's going through that they should be exempt from being covered by the Human Rights Act. So therefore, allowing, for example, the British Army to be involved should they be required in acts of torture. Do you think it's right that the British Army, under any theatre of war in which they've been involved, should be exempt from prosecution the way that the Democratic Unionist Party have suggested? Surely no army should be above the law. I mean, they aren't above the state. Um, what do you feel about that? I don't think that any army, any police force, any individual, any person should be above the law. Um, an atrocity is an atrocity is an atrocity. Um, so, no, I, I just don't agree with that principle. Uh, again, I've never been in a theatre of war. I've never been in that kind of conflict, and I don't know what happens in, in the heat of the moment. But ultimately, you cannot commit atrocities and expect, because you're wearing a uniform, that that's okay. It, no, so no, I just I simply don't agree that that's a, a viable position. If somebody wants to persuade me differently, then I'm prepared to hear that argument. But right now, no, I, I can't see any reason for a uniform giving you immunity. You were talking about that recognition of what happened was important, and, and that has been given to some extent. David Cameron's apology, you could argue, was the, the, the government at the time recognising that it was wrong. But maybe that further recognition... Exactly as you said, that no uniform gives you protection from being above the law. If something like that were to be stated, then that might make people feel that lessons have been learned. But we'll wait and see. Um, well, uh, I, I would think that the family would have to be involved. The families involved would have to be part of that that process because they're grieving. How they come to terms with what's happened to their loved ones. If if they were part of the process of going through that, then. I think that would that would be a, a, a hugely significant thing for the British government to do. Well, we just have to hope that, as you say, peace is maintained and that any um, uh, memorials happening today go off peacefully in the north of Ireland. Um, back to Westminster. This week, Keir Stammer has come out and said that Boris Johnson's behaviour over Partygate and everything else, basically, is undermining the union. Well, you could argue that actually maybe the Labour Party are also undermining the union. He's come out again and said there's no way that he would allow Indy to, but he would be interested in offering more powers to Scotland. Jim, we've been here before, have we not? <laughs> yes, we have. Um, and I find that, that the phrase that he wouldn't allow an Indy F2, it's not the position of... Uh, Westminster Prime Minister to allow the people of Scotland to make the decision about whether or not they want to have an independence referendum. The people of Scotland have voted. They've delivered a mandate to the SNP time and time again to deliver a referendum, and that's exactly what the SNP are going to do in this term. Um, more, more, more powers. The arrogance of it is just beyond belief that they will give us more powers as though somehow we are uh, uh, a nation that is, is not capable of running. Our... Yes, you're right. We've been here before. It's um, And the Labour Party, I've actually said this in the chamber in a couple of debates, that if the Labour Party want to be taken seriously in Scotland again, they have to actually accept the fact that the people of Scotland will have their choice on whether or not to be an independent country and get behind that... Uh, right to have the referendum. By all means, if they believe in the union, defend the union. Come back to us. Tell us what the 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 great things about the union are that they think that Scotland should stay part of it for. As far as I'm concerned, the union's broken, and they now have to to defend us staying in the union, as opposed to the SNP or the Yes movement having to continuously say, "Oh well, we should be independent because of this." They're not going to have to, to defend their their rationale behind what the union actually means to to the people of Scotland, uh, and I don't think Keir Starmer's doing anything to help Scottish Labour from um, its current travails. That's for sure. Well, it's interesting, isn't it, too, that you know when you look at the impact that the pandemic has had, in particular, um, the recent behaviour by the Prime Minister has had. It's definitely given the SNP a bounce in the polls. Um, it hasn't given Labour in Scotland the same bounce in the polls at all. But even yeah. actually nationally, Labour are struggling. So a week ago, 
they had a 10% lead. And in an opinion poll by Opinium, uh, just a couple of days ago, their lead had dropped to 5%. And you think, really, with everything that the country is facing, so not just Partygate and all of that, the huge increase in people's living expenses, the fact that the, the national insurance um, hike is going to go ahead and all the rest of it, if really Keir Stammer's Labour Party can't make a breakthrough in the rest of the UK, you really wonder what would have to happen, um, frankly. But Ian Blackford's been quite clear on this, and while he's no doubt we'd quite like to see the back of Boris Johnson um, in the chamber, um, he said that although moving, removing the Prime Minister would be the right thing to do in the light of what has happened or what we believe to have happened, what is alleged to have happened, that that's not going to really change anything. It doesn't change the imperative for an independence referendum to go ahead. And it doesn't change the fact that a Tory government in Westminster is only ever going to be hugely damaging for Scotland. So we shouldn't focus too much on Johnson the man. We have to think the wider picture. Would you think that's a fair comment? Well, it's absolutely a fair comment. Uh, and in fact, you know, the right thing to do is to get rid of Boris Johnson. But the longer he is there, the, um, the, the greater the imperative for, for Scottish independence. Um, but Ian's absolutely correct. It won't matter whether it's Michael Gove, Rishi Sunak, Lister, it won't matter who it is. The, the, we've seen time and time again, Westminster Tories do not care what happens to Scotland as long as the resource that Scotland has continues to flow towards London. And, um, you know, it's just time. We, we just need to, to, to put the, the question to the people do you want Scotland to be an independent country and get it done? Um, the, 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 we've had so many examples since 2014, so many examples of the promises of jam tomorrow, the promises of things that will come from Westminster if only we just hang on a little bit longer. It's been done to death. They've done it time and time again. And the people of Scotland are far more politically aware now. They're far more politically astute. And um, they're paying attention to what's happening. And we just need to keep reminding the people of Scotland, these are the things that happen when we are part of the UK. This is the amount of money that we're having to spend to mitigate some of the most devastating policies like the bedroom tax that the UK government ins inflict on Scotland. Think how much better we could be as a country if we had control of all of these things. Devolution has done its bit. It's demonstrated that when you've got a parliament in Edinburgh and you've got a government in Edinburgh who only has the people of Scotland to answer to and whose only desire is to make sure that we make things work for the people of Scotland, we can be so much better off. Um, and we're kind of caught between a rock and a hard place because in reality, it would be so much easier for the SNP to say, you know what, we're not going to mitigate that. The people of Scotland will just have to take the pain of what the UK Tory government are inflicting on Scotland, but we don't. We, we constantly put mitigations in place so the Scottish people never quite get the full impact. Mm. But the other side of that is what we're never getting is the full opportunities because Scotland has got so much to offer. We're such a, a vibrant business country and yet we can't get up and running because we don't have full control. So, um, you're, absolutely you're, you're right it when you say that you're, you're right. You're absolutely right when you say that this information needs to get out to the public. And your colleague, Michelle Thompson, made an excellent um, contribution to the bloody debate on Thursday, which we covered in full on the programme. We had a, 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 version, a copy of her speech um, when she was making that point that um, just what it's costing Scotland in terms of propping up, if you like, the debt of the UK government and what we could be yep. doing with that money. And, yep. you know, economics is, is a difficult subject for a lot of people. If you're a political geek, like a bit like me, then it's something you're like, quite interested in and you can follow. But getting those messages out is quite hard. And I think you're absolutely right. Although it's mitigating the worst excesses of the Tory government are the right thing to do, um, by a government in Scotland that cares about the people that it governs, it is in some way masking the worst. But there's worse that's being masked and hidden. And um, the most recent um, discovery that Alistair Jack, the Secretary of State for Scotland, is now very clearly aligned with a group within the Tory party who are called 
muscular unionists. I actually have to say that idea is really quite nauseating. Um, that includes people <laughs> like Jacob Rees-Mogg, um, that they're out to completely undermine the devolution settlement. And I think a lot of people in Scotland really are not aware of that. Now, there's a lot of people who are who voted no, but who believe in devolution. There's a lot of soft no's who believe in devolution, who might be even keen on the idea of Devo Max, who I think would be appalled if they knew what was happening. Now, there have been attacks on the devolution settlement already as a result of Brexit. But this latest thing to come out is there's something on the Conservative um, Home article linked the Scottish Secretary as being part of a senior group of Tory ministers undermining devolution and plotting further power grabs. And in particular, they've reported, it reports that they think the responsibility for health functions that fall under the devolved competency should now fall to Westminster. Now, that can't be dressed up as anything except a really firm attack. So, in response to that, how should the Scottish government come out uh, fighting, if you like, both the, the group in Westminster and in Holyrood? I don't think we should be fighting to maintain devolution or to get more devolved powers. We should be fighting for independence. You know, I, I said it before, the, 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 the Parliament in Holyrood has done its job in terms of demonstrating to the people of Scotland that we are more than capable of running our affairs for the benefit of the people of Scotland. And as far as I'm concerned, we, we argue about the, the devolved powers, they're, they're, they're taking away devolved powers, and they absolutely are. Make no mistake, the, the UK Internal Market Act, the subsidy control bill, um, what you're just talking about there. We also had a, we had a question in the Chamber last week asking how much money had been spent by the, the Scottish Government in um, starting to, to, to frame the, the, the next independence referendum. And the Tories are outraged, as are Labour, outraged at the, the Scottish Government could even think about spending any kind of money at all in this time of crisis um, on looking at independence. And yet they built a building on the other side of Holyrood with thousands of staff in it with the clear aim of making sure that they suppressed the powers of the parliament that was democratically elected two and a half streets away. So uh, there is absolutely nothing clearer um, that they are going to do everything they can to suppress the power of the devolved parliament that we currently have. In fact, I constantly put things out on my Twitter feed and I get a rash of responses from particularly strong unionists who would scrap Holyrood altogether. They would mm. do away with it completely. Say it's a waste of money, it's a waste of time, and all it's done is create division within Scotland. So there's no doubt in my mind. In fact, in 2016, just after the, the EU referendum, I, as when I was farmer, I went to the, the NFU um, a, a annual general conference. There's two of them, two conferences. And I asked Ruth Davison and David Mundell, where will the powers lie for agricultural support? In the once we actually come out of the EU, and neither of them gave an answer as to where the power. All they would say was, "Oh yeah, you, there'll be even more powers will be coming to the Scottish Parliament." Now it's not true. Even back then, they were already planning how they were going to be stripping powers away from Scotland, and that is going to be continuing to happen. The more times we win elections in Scotland, the more pressure that they are going to put on Holyrood and to try and take powers back. Powers devolved, their powers retained, and it's time that we got on and delivered this referendum so that we and, can... And I, I mean, I accept that your focus has to be on, on pushing um, towards the independence referendum, but as I was saying, for people who are not quite there yet, the devolved settlement is the thing, if they realise that it's being um, put at risk, might be enough to make people make that extra leap, if you like. And again, you, you made the excellent point at the beginning of the programme that it's kind of weird of Johnson to be defending the democracy of the Ukraine and other countries who might be at risk from pressures from countries like Russia and yet not prepared to look at the de democratic systems and settlements in the UK. And clearly that's yeah. what devolution is. Um, 
sort of in the same area of this discussion, um, when we're saying, you know, the SNP have had a, a, a bounce in the polls, not just a bounce in the polls, um, the annual Scottish Household Survey has had to take place by telephone this time because of COVID. It's not the usual face to face. Normally 10,000 people are involved in that survey. It's a smaller sample. But the statistics coming out make a pretty encouraging reading, actually, for the Scottish Government. Um, there is generally very high satisfaction with the way the Scottish Government is performing. There's high satisfaction with housing, local services, including healthcare. Not so strong on people feeling they've got a particularly strong voice within their local areas to affect decisions, which maybe hints at one of the big things that needs tackled as a programme for government in future in Scotland is how to make local government more accountable or people feel that it's something that they, they can engage with. But um, there were some really interesting and quite heartening um, figures about how people felt about their neighbourhoods. 88% 88 per, 88 of adults agreed they could rely on someone in their neighbourhood if they felt alone and needed help. 96% um, of adults rated their neighbourhood as a fairly or very good place to live. 94% um, of households were fairly satisfied with their housing. You know, in a society where we keep sort of saying that communities under threat and people are more selfish and care more about themselves, and I think the pandemic threw up some of that, this has to be quite heartening. Are you, I don't know if you've seen the survey details, that survey information in detail, but I just wondered if you had any thoughts on what that says about that idea of community in Scotland. Well, I, I haven't seen that, um, but I'm hugely happy to hear what you've just said. And the thing that actually sprung to mind was um, we keep hearing in the chamber that, you know, the, the disaster that the SNP are, the Tories are, oh, you know, it's been 14 years of absolute disaster. And yet we're getting a survey that come back like, like the one you've just quoted, talking about society. And it was their leader, Margaret Thatcher, who said there is no such thing as society. Indeed. Um, there is no such thing as communities working together. You know, Norman Tebbett was the guy that says, get on your bike and go and get a job elsewhere, as they dismantled huge swathes of communities right across the central belt and the, and the, and the industrialised parts of Scotland. So I'm, I'm hugely encouraged to hear that report. And I think what, the, what we have is that genuine sense of coming together. And if people are looking for more local accountability, I see that as a good thing. I see that as them wanting to be engaged in the decisions that are made in their local area. So, so I'm 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 very heartened by that. That's you, you've cheered my morning up there. Thank you very much. <laughs> uh, one subject that does cause splits within uh, Scotland, across Scotland, and even splits within the independence movement is land reform. Now we know there is land reform legislation planned for 2023. Too early to know what's in that, I think. But obviously this is an area of huge importance to you in a rural community. And I think you're on the Rural Affairs Committee as well, Jim, if I'm correct. And this is this latest discussion about what's been called rewilding. That's some of the larger landed estates who have decided ahead of legislation coming in, which is going to make grouse shooting in Muirburn only permissible under a licence, but deciding to stop their estates um, taking part in the traditional countryside sports that have happened in the past that made Scotland the kind of playground of the rich, trying to return states to a more natural state um, because, as some of the landowners have said, the, the land has been abused. Now, while on the, on the, on the surface that seems um, an important uh, and, and a very welcome issue, especially the potential benefits it might have for um, climate change, there's a lot of concern that what that might also do is seriously undermine the economies of these local areas because so many people's jobs are dependent on supporting the country state's traditional roles. And it's gone. some people have gone as far as to say it might herald the start of a new Highland clearance. So how do we square that circle, Jim, between wanting our, our natural estates in Scotland and the natural estate of the countryside in Scotland to be better and better managed and less abused and propping up some rural economies which are quite fragile. What's the right approach, do you think? Oh, it, it, it's a, the thing about land reform in Scotland is it's hugely, hugely complex. It's not a, it's not a one solution that will fix all the problems. It's not about, you know, taking all the land back from the 500 uh, largest owners and, 
you know, it's a very, very complex issue. And um, I don't have any concerns in reality about who owns the land. I'm more concerned about how the land is used and how the local communities get the benefit of living in that area and can contribute to that area. So let me give you an example. Imagine the Scottish government owned all the wild lands in Scotland, but for economic uh, terms, grouse shooting was hugely expen uh, hugely valuable. If the Scottish government turned over tens of thousands of hectares to, to driven grouse moors, just because the Scottish government owns it, wouldn't mean to say that the Scottish government would then get the support of people who were dead against grouse moors. So the, the ownership isn't as big an issue for me rather than the, the, than the land usage. But Scotland's landscape is changing, there's no doubt about it. Um, we're, we've got big ambitions to plant more trees and there is still a discussion ongoing about the right trees in the right place uh, and how that affects local communities, how much say communities have in it. And that that conversation is ongoing. I know Mary McCallan is doing a hell of a lot of work on, on, on engaging with people. Um, but we've got a, a we've got to have a, a, a situation where we don't chuck the baby out of the bathwater. You've got to make sure, for me, the biggest problem would be real de rural depopulation. Mm -hmm. So if we're going to put things into to rural Scotland. What we can't have is that it wipes people out. So the, the people who are spending huge amounts of money going in and, and buying up huge swathes of Scottish land and then putting two or three tenant farming families off the land in order to plant it all, I think that's abhorrent. Well, that's what, that, 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 but that's what people are discussing. That's what this, the so-called green yeah. layers. People are saying it could yeah. be without some careful um, stewardship from somebody create almost yeah. a second Highland clearance. And that's emotive language, yeah. obviously. But there is it some, is. I think there is some evidence that that's potentially going to happen. And I know that you say that the ownership for you personally, the ownership of the land isn't the real issue, it's the land usage. But for a lot of people, the ownership is a big issue. As you said, yes. 500 people own half the land in Scotland. I mean, that's a pretty unique situation. I think, I don't know what it's like in other parts of Europe, but certainly it's unique within a sort of Northern Europe, Scandinavian um, kind of context. And ah. there's a feeling with some people that, and okay, I hear what you say that we can't just take the land back. I think there's quite a few people who'd like to do exactly that, but I think that's probably yes. not very likely. I mean, we're getting into the realms of old properties theft in that case, and I don't think there's any, um, I don't think any government has a, has a uh, would want to do that. And um, although there is a strong, you know, there's a strong feeling that maybe that needs to be considered or something needs to be considered. Um, but it's what we do in the future. And, you know, one of the things is maybe instead of a piece of land or an estate comes up for sale and it doesn't necessarily go to the highest bidder, isn't there time for some sort of um, sustainability, equality, impact assessment to be made or something? Or what are you going to do economically for the land? How is it going to affect people? Is it going to create more jobs? You know, and that sometimes feels like it doesn't happen or that community buyout should get first refusal or public ownership under the public sector to get first refusal, that it doesn't automatically get driven by the market. I think that's what people are interested in in the future. How do you feel about the, that? The only, the only concern I would have with, with that position, though, Maggie, is um, what are the human rights of the people who own the land that are selling it because I could imagine that the Scottish government, this isn't a personal view, it's just an observation. What would the, the Scottish government face in terms of legal rights of the people who are selling it that the government are making it prohibitive for them to be able to get the value of the land that they've bought in good faith? at a period of time. Now, I'm getting into to legal stuff that I, I really don't know. No, I think, I think you're right. And it's, it's, it's a really good point. And I'm not saying this is my, what, the things I've suggested are not necessarily, well, not my opinions, but they're opinions that some land reformers have put forward. And I think that is a good point that, yes, people who own property have a right to be able to maximise that asset. And you might find yourself in a position where you've got government subsidising multimillionaires in order to make up the difference that they might get. And that also isn't right so but it just seems a bit that we're if we don't think about doing something 
differently, that we are kind of hamstrung and that actually yeah. there's not going to be any chance of real land reform. Is there anything that can be done with existing landowners to make sure that they are putting things in place in order that they are addressing these issues of rewilding or making the, the land use better and less preserved just for the very wealthy to go and shoot things on. Um, is there anything that can be done around that? I mean, there's, there's some annoyance that there's a lot of grants being given out to landowners to do things like that, and they shouldn't really be given these grants. But if you're interested in how the land is used better, and yet we mm -hmm. can't do anything about the ownership, how is that land going to be better without it potentially affecting local communities and people being areas being depopulated and people losing their livelihoods? It's a big question, well, I know that. But there is legislation it's, it's coming down the question. line and I don't know if you know what's in that or what might be in it. No, I don't. I, I genuinely don't know what's what's coming down the line with the, with the land reform. The, the Scottish Government has already invested tens of millions of pounds in community buyouts um, of land and they're supporting people to, as they're supporting communities to be able to buy up land. Um, but land reform is, is going to be an evolution rather than a revolution. Because if it's a revolution, we're going to land up in the kind of land grab kind of situation that they that they had in in, in Africa. Um, we've got to do it stage by stage, protecting the, the the environment that we've got, enhancing the environment that we've got, enhancing the biodiversity, working with the farming community, working with the shooting community. Now, I'm not a shooter. I I take absolute I would take absolutely no pleasure at all in going out and shooting wildlife um, uh, for hunting or whatever. Uh, but some people make a living out of it. There are vast swathes of the countryside where communities are maintained by having shooting on estates. Um, I'm not talking about driven grouse moors necessarily. Uh, and, I'm, and I am and I know that I will get a lot of criticism from people saying, oh, all that does is create barren wastelands for, for one specific species. It doesn't. I've lived and worked on, on, a, on a hill farm where there was grouse shooting. We had sheep. We had cattle. The, the wildlife that was on the farm, the hill farm that I was on, was hugely abundant. I mean, we had um, we had hen harriers, we had golden eagle, we had uh, sea eagles used to pass through us, uh, we had peregrine falcons, we had merlin, we had a huge range of, of wildlife. Um, the the ground nesting birds that were that were on the estate that I was that I was farming on were massive. What I saw was a huge decline in the ground nesters after the raven numbers came up. So it's too simplistic to say, if we do this, then that will create a, pro a, a solution to a problem. We have to, we've got to do this very, very carefully um, because we do not want to see land degradation. We want to make sure that our ecology is growing in partnership with the people who own the land. We want to make sure that rural depopulation doesn't happen. We want to make sure that the wee schools, the garages, the local shops continue to be um, used by the people who live in those areas. And it's a complex situation. And we don't have time uh, to go over all the possibilities and solutions in, in the space of even a one hour show. It's something that we have to evolve with the full cooperation and working of the people who currently own that land and how do we change the, 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 the colour of the land and the shape of the land and how the land looks over the next 10, well, 15, 20 you've, years. You've just said it. It's a hugely complex situation, but it is a pretty key issue in the independence debate. And maybe you've um, sort of inadvertently given us the idea of the two sides. It's revolution or evolution. It's likely to be somewhere in the middle. And I've no doubt that land reform is something that this programme will come back to a lot. I know the producers particularly interested in that subject. Anyway, we've reached the end of our hour. Thanks very much, Jim. We've covered a lot of stuff today. Um, <clears throat> just to remind you, as ever, that it takes money to keep Broadcasting Scotland on air. And if you believe in independent broadcasting, if you like the fact that we cover stories that perhaps you don't see in the mainstream press or take an angle that you don't see reflected anywhere else, then please think about helping us by making a regular donation and contributing to the ongoing success of the station. www.broadcastingscotland forward slash uh, www... Oh, it's gone off the screen. <laughs> www.broadcastingscotland forward slash donate to make your regular donation and help us keep going. Just thank you again, Jim, um, and I will see you back on Thursday evening for Scotland at 7. Thank you. Have a nice Sunday.